Hello and welcome to the Agile Innovation Leaders Podcast. I'm Ola Ojako. On this podcast, I speak with world-class leaders and doers about themselves and a variety of topics spanning Agile, Lean Innovation, Business, Leadership, and much more with actionable takeaways for you, the listener. I am honored to have with me Ivan Leiborn. He is the founder and CEO of the Business Agility Institute, an international membership body that champions and supports the next generation of organizations. I am really, really pleased to have you here. Thank you for making the time, Ivan. No, thank you, Ula. I'm looking forward to this. Awesome. Now, so I always start with my guests. I'm very curious to know who is Evan and how did you evolve to the Evan we know right now today? Oh, uh, I suppose that's a, that's a long one, isn't it? Um, so I'm Australian. Yeah. I was born in a small country town in the middle of nowhere um, called Armadale. It's about midway between Sydney and Brisbane, uh, about 800 kilometers from both, about 200 kilometers inland. And um, moved to Sydney when I was fairly young. Now, I've spent my entire childhood moving um, house to house, city to city. So the idea of stability I suppose is not something that I ever really had as a child. I'm not saying this is a bad thing. I had, a, I, I had, a, I had as good as childhood as, a, as any, but I, it's, I love moving. I love new experiences. And that's definitely one of the, I think, drivers for me in when I talk about agility, this, this idea that the world changes around you. I think that a lot of that early childhood just just disruption um, mm-hmm. is actually put me in a pretty good place to, to understand and to I deal with the disruption of well the world <laughs> and then say well we've got COVID and everything else right now so obviously there is a big that there are issues right now and disruption is the name of the game. Um, I started my career as a techie. I was a systems administrator in Solara Systems, then a programmer, then a, then a business intelligence data warehousing person. So I've done a lot of that sort of tech space. And, but you mentioned like the Business Agility Institute, and this is the organization I work now. Um, but probably have to go back to 2008 when I, I've been using Agile capital A Agile, Scrum and XP primarily, a little bit of FDD mm-hmm. in uh, the data warehousing, business intelligence space. Mm-hmm. And in 2008, I got promoted to be an executive in the Australian public service. And this was, I think, my first exposure to, like, before that, I'd run teams, I'd run mm-hmm. projects. I knew how to do stuff. Um and you and, and it's like being a first level leader, a project manager, it, it, it's it's everything is personal. Mm. Right? I don't need process. I don't need like, all those things that make organizations work or not work, as the case may be, because when you've got seven people reporting to to, to, to you, like that's a personal form of management. So when I became a director. This was, I think, my first exposure into just how different the world was when it, or the world of business was. And I'll be blunt. Yeah. I wasn't a good director. I, um, I got the job because I knew what to do. I, I, I knew how to, like, I, I could communicate in the interview how to, like, build this whole government uh, program. And that isn't enough. I, I had this assumption that because I was good at X, I would be good at being a leader of X. Mm-hmm. And that's not the case. And so I actually, I, there's a, there, 
there's a concept called the Peter Principle, uh, being promoted to your level of incompetence. Incompetence, yeah. And that was me. I, it, it's that's literally I I didn't know what I was doing. And of course, uh, no one likes to admit to themselves that they're a fraud. Um, it took my boss at the time to tell me that I was arrogant. Um, cause, and, and that actually hurt because it's like, I don't see myself as arrogant. It's, it's not part of my mental model of myself. And so, uh, that push that, that sort of sharp jab at my ego, at my sense of self was enough to go, hang on. Well, actually, maybe I need to look at what it means to be a leader, what it means to, 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 to create that kind of skill set and I had this idea at the time that this thing that I'd been doing back as a techie called agile maybe that might uh, help me solve the problems I was I was facing as an executive coordination collaboration mm -hmm. uh, not not amongst seven people but amongst like five six different government agencies where we're trying to build this whole of government program yeah. and long story short it worked and this was sort of my first aha moment around what we sort of now would call or what I would now call business agility um, though uh, definitely what I was doing back in 28 uh, in, in 2008 was very a far cry from what I would think of as good business agility, it was more like agile business. Um, but that was that's what sort of set me up for the last almost 15 years of my career in helping and and in advocating for creating organizations that are customer centric with mm -hmm. like employee engagement, engaged people. Uh, that idea of we can be better if we have take these values and these principles that we hold so dear in a technology space and we make that possible we make that tangible in a business context so it's a bit rambly but that's kind not, of the journey that got me to where i am not to me at all i find it fascinating i mean fascinating um you know hearing people's stories and journeys now there's something you said about you know you weren't a good director you knew how to do the work, but you just didn't know, or you weren't so good at the leadership aspect. And then you had a wake up moment when your um, your boss told you you were coming off as arrogant. Looking back now and knowing what you now know in hindsight, what do you think were the, 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 the behaviors you were displaying that whilst it wasn't showing up to you then, but you now know it could be misconstrued as arrogance. So let me take one step. I will answer your question, but I want to take sure. one step before that because I've come to learn that this is a systemic problem. Right? So the first thing, I shouldn't have been given that job. Right? Now, did I do a good job? Eventually, yes. And, and, and I grew into it. And I'm not saying you need to be an expert in the job before you get it. Learning on the job is a big part of it. But we, as a society, see that management is innate. It's something that you have or you don't. And that's completely wrong. I, you don't look at a nurse or a doctor or an engineer and think, I can do their job. No, you think... If I go to university and train, I can do their job. I don't think we look at a janitor and go, I can do their job without training. Mm -hmm. A janitor is going to receive on the job, like it might be a couple of days, but they're going to receive on the job training. There was a study by, I think it was Career Builder, 58% of managers receive no training. Yeah. Yeah. We just have this assumption that I'm looking at my boss. I can do their job better than them. <laughs> and maybe you can, but better isn't the same as good. Like if they've reached their level of incompetence, right, it, it, like, yes, you could probably be better, yeah. but not good. And so I think the skills of management are, it's an entirely different skill set to what the, the thing that you are managing. 
Hmm. Right? So I was good at, I was director of business intelligence. So I was good at business intelligence, right? Data warehousing systems, right? I didn't have the skills of management, right? Running a, a, a $35 million PL, right? Coordinating multiple business units. Right? building out those systems and, the, and, and actually designing the systems that enabled effective outcomes. And so I think I'm going to touch on two things. Sure. The first is people, and I definitely, should have invested in learning how the skills of management before I became a manager. Right? Not so that you're perfect, not so that you're an expert manager before you start, because you will learn more on the job than you ever will from anything before you, before you do that job. But I didn't know what I didn't know. Yeah. Right? I didn't know I was a bad manager. I, I was completely blind to that fact. I knew that outcomes weren't happening and that I was struggling, right? but I half the time it's oh, why won't people listen to me why won't they do what i say right um which okay yes <laughs> definitely not servant leadership material but i didn't even know servant leadership was a thing mm -hmm. right so that's the point at a minimum i should have known what it took to be a manager the skills that were going to be required of me i should have made some investment in building that before i took that job which is now the second point as to they shouldn't have given me the job, right? And the, again, this is this goes to that systemic problem. Uh, I, I forget who like like there was like a Facebook like or a Reddit like screenshot tweet meme thing, <clears throat> and uh, I saw it like six or seven years ago, and it stuck with me ever since. It was God save us from confident middle aged white men, right? <laughs> and. <laughs> I wasn't middle-aged. I was, I think, the youngest director in the public service at the time. Um, but I definitely was confident. And for those of you not watching the video, I am white. Um, <laughs> so the privilege and the assumption, I, I, I carried confidence into the interview. Of course I can do the job. I, I, I've run this team. I know how to do, like, I know business intelligence. I know how to, I know how to design business intelligence systems. And, and it's like, it, it's, it's sure it's a different scale, but it's the same thing. Right? And because I came across as confident, because I thought I could do the job, right? I thought it was just what I was doing before plus one, right? But it wasn't because Sure, I could do I could do the plus one part, but that was thirty percent of the role. Right? I was completely missing everything else, and so that's that other systemic problem which I have learnt sadly um, over the last decade and a half. In terms of just we overvalue confidence, then empathy. Mm -hmm. uh, we overvalue confidence over skill, you know? And I had one, I was empathetic, right? I didn't have, and but I was weak at the skills, the management skills. Hmm. Uh, I should have had all three, competence, confidence, and empathy. Hmm. But we value in interviews as, as hiring managers, we interview confidence a lot more than the other two quite often. And that is, I think, the one of the real systemic problems we have in the world, especially in tech, um, but just generally in the world. Awesome. I, I mean, I was going to ask you, you know, what were those skills, but you've kind of summarized it into competence, com confidence, and, and empathy. empathy. All right. So, well, I'm glad to hear the story had, you know, a, a happier ending because you definitely <laughs> changed course. Um, so now knowing, again, what you now know, and you're speaking to a van of 2008, what are the things before going for that job would you have told him to skill up in, to be prepared for management? So 
let me get very specific. Right? Yeah. So confidence, competence, empathy. I th for me, those are the, so this is something that I came up with, or I, I, I don't know where this idea emerged from. It's something that I've carried with me for the better part of a decade. Hmm. For me, those three attributes are my measures of success. Right. If I can have all three, right, that's what can make me successful. Going deeper, the, the, some of the specific skills that we need, that, that I needed. Right? So the first one, emotional intelligence. Now, I know that's, a, that's broad and fuzzy, but there were many times and many times since, I'm not saying I'm perfect and I'm not perfect now. I, this last week, there have been challenges um, um, where it's like I've misobserved and go, oh, I wish I'd seen that. Right? But being able to understand when you're not hearing somebody, mm -hmm. right? when they're talking to you and you're listening but not hearing, uh, and so the emotional intelligence to sort of read and understand that there's a gap, there's a there's a something missing between what is being said and what is being processed up there in the little gray cells. The other one, oh, the, the, a couple, right? I'll call it emergent strategy. Mm. Right? So this idea of the three-year plan is completely ridiculous. It, it, it's, it's, it's been wrong <laughs> for 30 years, um, but we don't develop enough of the counter skill, which is being able to take an uncertain environment uh, and uh, where there's insufficient information and ambiguity, make a decision, but design that decision with feedback loops so that you know the decision is probably wrong, right? That strategic decision is probably wrong. So rather than sort of run with it for three months and then make another decision, it's designed with these feedback loops. So it's the next decision is better because you, it's the whole system, the whole strategic system is designed to create those loops. And that was a key skill that I, that I was missing in that, this is the government, right? I was a Prince2 project manager, uh, MSP program manager. I, I knew how to build the Gantt charts. And, and I was also an agilist. I, like, like I've been doing Scrum for the past five years, hmm. but like Scrum at a team level and agility at a business level was not something that many people had even thought about. And so all of the, the program level strategy was not agile, Again, this is 2008. And so we had this, like, if I'd known how to build an emergent adaptive strategy, um, a lot of the challenges, the, 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 the systems level challenges would have been resolved. I think this, and, and I could go a long time, but I'll give you one more. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to say communication, but not in the way that, I think many people think about it. It's not about like conveying ideas or conveying messages, but it is that empathetic communication. Mm -hmm. It goes with that emotional intelligence and so forth, but it's the ability to communicate a vision, mm -hmm. the ability to communicate an idea and intent, not just the ability to communicate a fact, or a, a requirement, like th those are important too, but I could do those. Uh, but I had a large, like teams of teams uh, across, and not all of them reported to me, this was a whole of government program. So yeah. there were people who reported to the program, but their bosses were in a completely different company, right? government department to me. Uh, and so I needed to learn how to align all of these people towards a common vision, a common goal beyond just a, here's your requirements, here's the Gantt chart for the program, please execute on this one, two, three, four, five, right? Which sure they did, but it, it's, 
they would, uh, uh, what's that saying? I think it was, I think it was Deming. Um, uh, give someone a measurable target and they will destroy the company in order to make it. Right? And you give them these, it's like, they will do like what that Gantt chart says, they even if that. the world changes around them right? and it's the wrong thing to do. Uh, and oh God, we know, and we've learned a lot better as a world. Like, the idea of, a, of program level agility is pretty standard now. Um, but 2008, it definitely wasn't. <laughs> definitely not in government. <laughs> definitely not in Australia. Yeah. Um, so I, being a, if I had been able to communicate intent and vision and get them yeah. aligned to that vision and not just aligned to a Gantt chart, we would have been a lot more successful. We would have mm -hmm. a lot more buy-in, a lot more engagement. Mm -hmm. So there's more, there's a lot more, but those would be, I think, some of the three that I would say really, really learn <laughs> um, before you get the job. Well, thanks. Thanks for that. I'd like to just dive in a bit more because you said something about designing. You, you would have benefited if you knew how to design and build you know an adapt that adaptive emergent strategy yeah how do you do that now what what, what what's the process for doing this so let so let me jump to the to the to to the present yeah right? so um i run the business agility institute we're yeah. a fiercely independent advocacy and research organization mm -hmm. Um, we've been around for about four years. We don't do consulting. We're funded by our members primarily. Mm. Now, um, one of the very first publications that we put together was something called the Domains of Business Agility. Yeah. Um, it's not a framework. It doesn't tell you how to do it. It's not like Scrum or Safe or Beyond Budgeting. Well, actually, mm. Beyond Budgeting is not quite. A... <sighs> if Beyond heard me call Beyond Budgeting a framework, I'd be in trouble. Um, <laughs> I call it the Don't Forget Model. Right. Because if you're going to change an organization, these are the domains that you can't forget. Um, the customers at the center around that are what we call the relationships, the yep. workforce, your external partners, your vendors and contractors and suppliers, and your board of directors, because they represent ownership of the business. Around that are the nine, what, what I think of as what domains, right? These are the things that you need to focus on, right? There's leadership domains, individual domains, and so forth. Jeez. One of them is strategic agility, right? otherwise known as adaptive strategy or emergent strategy. Hmm. Now, one of the reasons that is one of the core domains of business agility and has been since 2018, I think, when we first published this, um, is because this is one of the fundamental capabilities for an organization to not survive, but thrive in uncertainty. Now, uh, there are different approaches and, and I, there's a whole bunch of um, uh, different frameworks and approaches to this, like four quadrant matrixes yeah. and tools and canvases. I'm not gonna go to any of that because <clears throat> A, all the tools are fine, Right. So find the one that works for you. Right. Google will be your friend there. But what I want to do is, however, just look at what the characteristics of all mm. of those tools, what do they have in common? Yeah. And I'm going to do that by really telling a little bit of a story. Okay. Uh, one of the things that we run is the Business Agility Conference in New York. Um, it did run every March. Um, uh, in New York City until 2020. Well, actually, it ran in 2020. Okay. Um, I know the exact date COVID was declared a pandemic because I was literally on stage because I had to tell our delegates that it, this was now officially a pandemic. Um, and if you needed to leave early to get flights and so forth, because we had delegates from Denmark and Switzerland, um, then please feel free to leave and all that kind of thing. Now, this isn't about the conference, but it's about what was happening before the conference. Mm. So you had this emergent problem, COVID-19, starting in China, hitting Italy, 
right? And I think it was like February 28th or March 1st, thereabouts, the first case hit America, mm. right? And uh, it was California. I think it was Orange County. California, yeah. I think, was the first case. And what happened was we started to see companies change, mm. right? Now, I describe it, well, I'm sorry, um, these aren't my words. I'm stealing this from a comic I saw uh, on Facebook at the time. We saw companies responding and companies reacting. Mm. Right? Now, this is the difference between strategic agility and not strategic agility. So what was happening? So the first company pulled out from the conference. I, I travel ban, our people can't attend. Right? Within a week, we'd lost about 50% of our delegates. Right? Now, remember, all we know at this point, this isn't the COVID of today. Mm. Right? I, all we knew was there was a disease. It was more contagious than the flu. It was deadlier than the flu. And it had hit America. Right? We didn't know much more than that. Um, we certainly didn't imagine it would be two years later and we're still dealing with it. I, I, I remember thinking at the time, it's like, all right, we'll have a plan for like September. We'll do something in September. It'll be fine by then. Right? And uh, famous last words. <laughs> but companies had to make a decision. Right? Every company didn't have a choice. You were forced to make a decision. Right? Now, the decisions were like, do I go to a conference or not? Right? Do I ban travel for my employees? Yeah. Do we work from home? That, that decision came later. Right? But there was a first decision to make. And you know what? There's no, there was no difference between companies. Those companies that responded and reacted made the first decision the same. Right? Mm -hmm. right? It's what came next. Right? Those companies that were reacting because every day there was something new that came up, a new piece of information, more infections, a new city, right? new guidance from the World Health Organization or the CDC. Right? And companies had to make decisions every single day. Yeah. And those that were reacting took the information of the day and made the decision. Those that were responding right, took the decision they made yesterday the new information, looked at the pathway that was emerging, that's that emergent strategy, yeah. uh, out of it and made the next decision. And so those strategic decisions that they were making as an organization were built on the ones that came before yeah. rather than discrete decision after decision after decision after decision. And so what ended up happening is you had those companies who were able to build a coherent strategy on insufficient information that grew and adapted and emerged as new information emerged, were better able to respond to the pandemic than those that were chaotically making decisions. And you could see that in something as simple as how quickly they could start working from home mm -hmm. you know, and, or how quickly they made the decision to work from home. Because those that responded, right, they had this threat of strategy. And so they were able to make the decision to work from home much faster and they were able to execute on that much faster. Yeah. Uh, whereas those that were not, did not. And I think of this as, as going to the agile gym or the business agility gym. Yeah. Right? No company was prepared for the pandemic. No company had a, a strategy paper of, if there's a worldwide pandemic, these are the things yeah, that we're going good. to do. Right? But those companies that had practiced emergent strategy, right, in their product, in, the, in, in, in how they engage with the marketplace, they'd sort of, uh, they'd taken concepts like lean startup and yes. adopted some of those practices into their organization. Those who had been to the agile gym, they, knew how to respond. They weren't prepared for the scale of the pandemic. No one had done emergent strategy at that scale, hmm. uh, but they knew, they had the muscle memory. They knew how to do it. And so they just scaled up and, and operated in that new context. 
and it, it's like literally going to the gym it's it's if i build up my muscles right? I, mean, I definitely don't go to the gym enough but if i did <laughs> i i could lift more weights so if a friend goes hey mate can you help me move a fridge right I'm able to do that because I have the capabilities in my body to do that. Yeah. If I don't go to the gym, which I don't, <laughs> not enough. I, and my mate goes, Hey, can you help me move a fridge? It's like, I can help, but I'm not going to be that much help. <laughs> uh, it's, 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 I'll stop it. I'll stop it from, from tilting. Right? <laughs> I'm not going to be the lifter. Right? So the capabilities of that business agility enabled right, that emergent strategy or, or the responsiveness during a pandemic, even though no one was prepared for it. Right? And that's kind of really what I see as organizations as they adjust to this new world. Now, <laughs> you, <laughs> you have this book, um, actually, you've, you've authored a couple of books at the very least, you know, there's the No Projects, A Culture of Continuous Value, and Directing the Agile Organization, A Lean Approach to Business Management. Which one would you want us to discuss? <laughs> so, so uh, No Projects is the most recent book. Um, mm -hmm. Directing the Agile Organization is definitely based on my experience uh, uh, like it's drawing upon that experience back in 2008. I, I started writing it in 2009. Um, it is out of date. Um, the ideas that are in that book are out of date. Um, I wouldn't suggest anyone reads it unless you're more interested in history. <laughs> um, there are ideas. So sometimes I'll talk about the difference between business agility and agile business mm. right? um, where business agility is definitely the, it's creating this space where things can happen properly through values and culture and and practices and processes but also it's very human it's very focused on the outcomes whereas agile business is more how do we apply scrum to marketing teams um, and so my right. first book is unfortunately much more agile business than business agility. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in so let's go to no projects then. There yeah. is a, a quote in a review of the book that says, "Okay, the metrics by which we have historically defined success are no longer applicable. We need to re-examine how value is delivered in the new economy." What does that mean? What's your what do you mean by that? So the reason I wrote the No Projects book, and this predates the Institute. Mm. So, so this is back when I was a consultant. Um, I had run a transformation program for a large multinational organization. And their project management process was overwhelming. Um, everything was a project. The way they structured their organization was that um, the doers were all contractors um, or, or, or vendors. Every yeah. employee was a project manager. And so what ended up happening was they've got this project management process and it would take, I'm not exaggerating, nine months, 300 and something signatures to start a project, wow. even if that project was only like six weeks long. There were cases where the project management cost was seven to eight times the cost of the actual execution. Um, now that's an extreme case, certainly, and not all were that, uh, that ratio, but that was kind of the culture of the organization. And they were doing it to try and manage risk and ensure outcomes. And there's a whole bunch of logical fallacies and business fallacies in that, but that's another matter altogether. But what was happening is they were like, I'm going to focus in on one issue. I said there were many, right? But one issue was they valued output over outcome. They valued uh, getting a specific piece of work, a work package completed to their desired expectations. And they valued that more than the value that that work would produce. And you see, I've seen this in my career 
for decades where you'd run a project. Again, I used to be a project manager. I'm going back mm-hmm. like Prince too. Yeah. Of thing. Uh, um, you got this benefits realization phase at the end of a project. Right? And the project manager's gone. The project team is gone. Right? The project sponsor is still around. Right? But they're on to whatever's next. Something else. Half the time, benefits realization fell to the responsibility of finance uh, to go, okay, did we actually get the value out of that project? And half the time, they never did it. In fact, more than half the time, they never actually did it. It was just, it was just a uh, uh, yes tick. And for those of you who have written business cases, right, the benefits that you define in the business cases are ridiculous. Half they pluck it from there. <laughs> they pluck it from the air. It's 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 this. It's this bloody assumption that, hey, if we do this, it'll be better. I've seen business cases where it's like, um, we will save $10 million for this organization by making like, like page reloads half a second faster. So every employee will get three minutes back in their day, three minutes times how many employees times how average salary equals $10 million. It's like, how are you going to are you going to use that three minutes in some productive way? Is that mm-hmm. actually a benefit? Or are you just trying to upgrade your system and you're trying to convince finance that they need to let go of the purse strings so that you can do something that you want to do? Yeah. Um, so if, if we actually care about the value of things, then we should be structuring the work, not around the, not around the outcome, sorry, not around the output, output, but around the value. We should be incrementally measuring value we should be measuring the outcome on a regular basis. Agile, we should be delivering frequently, yeah. measuring the value. And if we're not achieving the value that we're expecting, well, that's a business decision. Right? Mm-hmm. What do we do with that piece of information? Uh, and sometimes it may be continue because we, we need to do this. Right? Other times it may be, is there a better way to do this? Mm-hmm. And once you're locked into that traditional project plan, then sure, you might be agile inside the project plan. You might have sprints and scrum and DevOps and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Right? But if you can't change the business rationale as yeah. quickly as you can change the technology, like the, 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 the sprint backlog, then what's the point? Hmm. So you, you mentioned something, and I know that some of the listeners or viewers might be wondering what's outcome versus output can you define that so oh yeah you know <laughs> there is a definition in the book which i wrote okay. like six years ago um, okay. so i'm going to paraphrase because i don't remember yeah. exactly the words that i wrote mm-hmm. um but an output is the thing the product the tangible element of what is created mm. right um uh, in writing a book the output is the book right um, in, uh, in this podcast, right? The output is the recording, the podcast that we're doing right now. The outcome and the impact is what we want to achieve from it, right? So the output of the podcast is we have a recording, but if no one listens to it, then why? Uh, the outcome is that, well, the ultimate outcome is changing hearts and minds. Oh, at least that's why yes. I'm here. That's um, why I do uh, it. <laughs> here we go. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, we want to create some kind of change or, 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 or movement in, well, in your case with your listeners, in the case of the book, the readers. Um, we want to create a new capability, a new way of looking at the world a new way of doing things and so the outcome is hopefully measurable but not always yes. right but it is that goal that intent exactly so i mean for me outcomes are like what they find valuable is either you're solving it helping them solve a problem or putting them in a position you know to get to um achieve some gains yeah 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 now let's just um are there any other books you might want to recommend to the to to the audience um that have impacted you or you know influenced you yeah so i'm going to recommend three books Mm -hmm. Um, two are very old books um 
So the first book is Deming, or actually anything by Deming, um, but Out of the Crisis is probably okay. the best one, the first one, otherwise New Economics. Mm -hmm. Deming is coming out of Lean and Manufacturing and the Japanese Miracle, but he might have been writing in the 80s, 70s, mm -hmm. right? but it's as agile as it gets. Right? His 14 points for managers reads like something that would emerge from the Agile Manifesto, right? So I definitely love, I, I will go to Deming quite regularly in terms of just great concepts and, and the articulation of it. Okay. The other book that I recommend for the idea, I have to make it's a bit of a hard read, um, is The Goal by Eli Goldratt. Goldratt, so yeah, I like The Goal, yeah. The theory of constraints, and, and if you Google Evan's theory of agile constraints, and I think mm -hmm. we're almost out of time, so I don't have time yeah. to really talk about yeah. it, but it, it's the theory of constraints, both in a practical sense as to how you actually optimize a process, but it also applies when you're looking at it from a holistic metaphorical standpoint, because I, I like to say you, there is a constraint to agility in your organization. You can only be as agile as your least agile function. Exactly. And it's not IT or software anymore. Mm. Uh, it's some other part of your business. Uh, yeah. You might have a, a sprint that can create a potentially shippable product increment every two weeks. But if it takes you three months to get a hiring ticket or nine months to get a budget change approved or six weeks to until the next project control board, uh, you're not, your agility is not measured in weeks. Your agility is still measured in months. Yeah. Right? So theory of constraints. I, I, the book's a bit hard to read. Um, mm. it, it's definitely dated, um, but the concept is so powerful. Yeah, it's more like saying the uh, chain is as strong as its weakest link, you know, in another way. I, I love them reading that book. Sorry, go on, your third book. That's it. <laughs> um, so the last one that I'm going to uh, recommend is... Um, uh, Sooner, Safer, Happier by uh, John Smart. Uh, it's a relatively recent book. Um, I, it's, it's the book I've read most recently, which is partly why it's, it's on the top of my mind. Um, it is a very powerful... Um, uh, it really touches to the human sense of agility um it's in the title sooner yeah. safer happier yeah. sooner is a is is a is a, is a, is a technical value uh, safer happier uh, these are these are more than that these are these are human values these are human these are human benefits um i know i said th uh, three but i'm actually going to add a Fourth. One more for the road. It, it, it comes to what I was talking about early in terms of my own experiences early yep. as a leader. Mm -hmm. um, and the book didn't exist at the time, but uh, Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. Brene Brown, okay. Um, growth mindset's a bit of a buzzword these days. Um, and there are definitely more mindsets than just growth and fixed. Mm -hmm. There are different kinds of mindsets that we hold. But just as a way of getting people to understand that you don't have to have all the answers, that you don't have to be right. So the reason I was arrogant, I was called arrogant uh, uh, by my boss at the time was because I didn't have a growth mindset. I didn't know I was wrong or I, I didn't know what I didn't know uh, and and it took some poking to sort of make myself realize that I needed to open up and I needed to, to be willing to learn because I didn't have all the answers and that assumption is as a manager as a leader you're meant to have all the answers is a very toxic um, uh, cultural systemic problem yeah. Um, uh, so yeah so so I think Brene Brown and the growth mindset work dare to lead is such a powerful concept that 
the more we can get people sort of internalizing internalizing it the better hmm. so how, thank you for that how can our, the audience um, engage with you where can they find you yeah so um uh linkedin is probably the easiest way um just okay. evan laybourne i think i have a I think I'm the only Evan Laybourne on the planet, so I should be fairly easy to find. Okay. Um, uh, otherwise, um, look out businessagility.institute. Mm -hmm. We have a very comprehensive library of case studies and references, uh, research uh, that we've published, the models like the domains, and we have a new behavioral model that's coming out fairly mm -hmm. soon. Um, and you can always reach me through the Business Agility Institute as well. Okay, and 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 for um, like leaders and organizations that would want to engage with the Business Agility Institute, would there be any are there any options for them with respect? Oh, to yeah. That? So we're yes. a membership organization. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So individuals can become individual members. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, fifty bucks a year. Um, uh, that's our COVID that's pricing. Um, we we cut it by fifty percent at the beginning of COVID because a lot of people were losing their jobs and we wanted to make it possible easier for them to maintain as members um uh that gives you access to like full access to everything we publish okay. books as well so you can actually download full ebooks of the ones that we published um and also obviously supports us and 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 helps us grow and helps us uh keep doing more uh, we are however primarily funded by our corporate members um so it's what we call journey companies those companies mm. who are on the journey to business agility um so td bank and dbs bank for example are two of our members telstra in australia um so th there is value in corporate membership and i'm not going to do the sales pitch if you are if you want to know more reach out to me and i'll definitely give you the sales pitch um so <laughs> awesome Awesome. Well, thank you so much. These will be in the show notes. And I want to say thank you so much, Evan, for making the time for this conversation. I definitely learned a lot and it was a pleasure having you. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate being here. That's all we have for now. Thanks for listening. If you like this show, do subscribe at www.agileinnovationleaders.com. That's agileinnovationleaders.com or your favorite podcast provider. Also share with friends and do leave a review on iTunes. This would help others find this show. I'd also love to hear from you. So please drop me an email at ola at agileinnovationleaders.com. Take care and God bless.